Welcome everybody, Joe Tarnowski with ECRM here, and I have with me today Jeff Walt, who's a Vice President and Editorial Director over at Ratcher Press, which is the publisher of MMR and Chain Drug Review, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, and uh, they've done some great coverage uh, both online and in print about the impact of COVID-19, and uh, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what the future outlook is going to be for retail what what our based on our observations of what's happening and uh what retailers are doing now to address it and prepare for the new normal so jeff thank you so much for joining us thank you joe it's a pleasure to be with you so i got a few topics that i want to cover and and first i'd like to start with actually the physical store what that's going to be but before i get into that what was interesting i literally just saw on the news this morning um, there was a story about a restaurant in the Netherlands that, you know, they're starting to open up over there and this restaurant rearranged its whole physical space to create individual enclosed seating areas for diners and they're served by people wearing PPE. And I thought that was interesting seeing how that physical space and their processes were, were kind of changing. And, you know, got me thinking, you know, what do you, what do you think or what do you see the, the actual physical store being like as we kind of start opening up and get out of this? Well, Joe, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, obviously, mass market retailing, which is what we focus on, the idea is to serve a lot of customers at once and, and make a lot of products accessible to a lot of people at a low price. The kind of measures that you were describing they're taking at that restaurant uh, obviously uh, are expensive and they obviously limit the number of people that can shop and they are dine or shop. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be a little bit of trial and error to figure out how to uh, manage to uh, get products to people who need them when they need them. Uh, at a reasonable price and also make sure they're safe in the stores. I think uh, as we've seen here in New York City where you and I both live and across the country, asks are um, uh, uh, recommended and I think probably will be required of shoppers and store staff. And, uh, you know, perhaps gloves, you know, I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how the whole thing evolves. Definitely there will be some adjustments uh, necessary. I don't know uh, if mass retailers can go to quite the extreme that that restaurant in the Netherlands is. That's right. How do you how do you shop a grocery store or a drugstore in that way? I mean, you're going. There's going to be people in there just by the the nature of the business, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. So by me in, in Astoria, Queens, I know restaurants are requiring masks to you know mm -hmm. even just to come in for takeout, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are requiring uh, gloves as well. So, um, you know, but they're going to, there's still going to be a need to maintain that space. And, and, you know, what we're, what I've been seeing is even in those states that are opening up, there was a report that the mobility, meaning the number of people that are out and about and doing things and visiting businesses is still remain the same as the mobility in states that are still pretty much closed, which really shows that. You know, even with given the opportunity, consumers are still scared and they're, they're going to take their own uh, uh, actions. I've heard conflicting reports about that, that uh, I know some of the healthcare experts, uh, I heard someone from the University of Washington speak last night, said that they do see some more mobility, not necessarily into retail stores, but more mobility among uh, people as, as you say, the states open up and, uh, you know, It'll be interesting to see what that has to impact that has on the curve. And, uh, you know, I think if things go well, maybe more people will be uh, uh, comfortable going back into retail settings. Um, but as you say, I think most consumers uh, have a little bit of trepidation at this point. Yeah, and in mass retail, what I've noticed is it's a little bit line management or queue management. It's a little bit tough. Uh, those that, there, there are some who do it really well where there's, there's a lot of barriers that kind of force the issue of social distancing. And then some others, they're just not set up. Uh, one grocery store, you know, traditional grocery stores, they'll have all the checkouts 
and then to have the aisles and maybe like, you know, 10 feet of space between the two. And then, you know, one place by me, they're doing line management by having everybody wait. Like the one line goes down the frozen foods aisle and somebody's there kind of guiding everybody. But numerous occasions when I've shopped there, it got confusing because maybe they misread that somebody was finished. They sent somebody to over there and then they weren't. So they send you back. Meanwhile, someone cuts in front of you because they think, that, you know, it just gets a mess sometimes. I think that's going to be an important factor, too. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot of that type of thing. And, and as you say, we are seeing it already. Uh, I've seen the line management within the stores as you go to check out. Uh, I've also seen some other retailers that limit the number of people in a store at any one time, and I think that'll become more common. And also, uh, at uh, one of the local Walgreens, they've uh, put up some shipping containers to essentially double the size of the checkout counter. So instead of being, you know, two and a half or three feet uh, between you and the cashier, it's double that. It's keeping six feet away from the cashier. And also, you know, we've seen the plastic screens go up around a lot of checkout counters, and I think all that is going to become quite common until we get uh, get a handle on the virus. When this first happened and there was a lot of people going to the stores, uh, the CVS by me did something that was brilliant. It was um, it happened to be on a corner, right? So you have you know, one street and another street. So they divided up. They said, okay, if you're waiting for a prescription, you go and line up along this street. And if you're waiting to go into the store, you go along this street. Again, mm -hmm. every, you know, markings on the sidewalk for social distancing and mm -hmm. then somebody guiding everybody in. We don't need that as much now because it's not as much traffic. But during that initial rush, I, mm -hmm. I thought that was a really great way of uh, kind of managing that crowd. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a smart thing. And I think we'll see more of that. Although, as you do point out, uh, people have calmed down a lot. There's not this... Uh, uh, sort of panic buying that we saw in the early days of the of this uh, uh, emergency, um, and uh, you know, by and large, I think stores are fairly uh, shoppable at this point, uh, even if people have to wait outside to get in. Yep, yep. Now there are still supply chain issues. I mean, uh, you know, talking about that uh, that big rush of people, you know. You know, obviously, sure, we all know about the toilet paper, the hand sanitizer, you know, and then a lot of the uh, uh, staples like food and everything. And it's not the fault of, you know, the retailers or the manufacturers, just such a uh, um, stress put on the whole uh, supply chain going all the way back. But I think that there's been a lot of changes. I've seen you've reported on a lot of ways that retailers have been adapting um, uh, to kind of help the issue of out of stocks. Can you, uh, including some interesting partnerships that have been happening. What, what are you seeing out there? Well, a couple of things, Joe. I think we really have to say the brick and mortar uh, people have done a pretty good job with the supply chain. Even in New York City, even in the epicenter of, of uh, the COVID crisis, um, I think Supermarkets and drugstores uh, have done a pretty good job of keeping most products in stock. Some of the ones you mentioned, obviously, are still a little problematic, cleaning supplies, paper goods, things like that. But, you know, there's no shortage of food, as far as I can see. Uh, there's no shortage of medicine uh, or other uh, essential uh, personal care, health care products. So I think, uh, you know, the supply chain's held up pretty well under tremendous stress. Now, uh, we haven't talked about e-commerce yet. I think uh, they have had uh, more problems in that regard. Uh, you know, Amazon uh, looked like it was invincible uh, for a long time. Suddenly, not so much. Uh, the uh, Amazon Fresh uh, service in New York is overwhelmed as all the uh, uh, online grocers are overwhelmed. And uh, I don't know if you've tried to get uh, a delivery, but uh, you know, it's weeks in advance if you're lucky. And most of the time, it just says not available. Um, so they have some work to do. Although, you know, in fairness to them, uh, they, they, they saw demand probably uh, double or triple or quadruple overnight. Uh, yeah. And uh, I will say, too, that, you know, I, I think Amazon, it's understandable why they're having problems with the, uh, with the fresh service. But uh, their, their regular delivery of non-food products is also uh, slipped during this situation. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just you get something like this. It's it just ma it really really maxes out the stress on the the whole supply chain. And you know, I've seen uh, as far as the like partnerships, I've seen in several cases retailers going to different and unique sources of supply to to kind of fill in the gaps. Uh, both you know, food service, for example, a lot of the food service distributors and suppliers, you know, with the restaurants being closed, they have extra inventory and some of the grocers have been reaching out to them even at convenience stores uh you know they're they're finding new sources of supply yeah absolutely and um you know uh, cisco is one uh great example of that um as you know uh kevin hurricane the uh, former president of cvs pharmacy has now gone and become ceo there and i think you know give him credit he has a lot of connections in the retail world and i think he shifted that business, and most of their business, the vast majority of their business, 90-some percent, was directed at restaurants and uh, you know, cafeterias and, and other uh, non-retail food uh, settings. And they pivoted and, I know, made a lot of alliances with uh, brick-and-mortar supermarkets and are, are sending uh, products there. And they've also helped some of their restaurant uh, customers convert all some or all of their restaurants into uh, sort of neighborhood markets and uh, are, are bringing in product there, which uh, restaurants are, are, are selling uh, almost as a convenience store or a small supermarket. Um, and uh, that obviously helps the restaurant customers stay afloat and helps people in those neighborhoods. Uh, so I think Cisco uh, deserves a lot of credit for pivoting quickly. And that's one good example of, of uh, what you're talking about. Do you think that's going to continue on? Like <clears throat> these relationships that were built kind of temporarily as a stopgap? Do you, you know, what do you think is going to happen with those relationships going on for I moving think, forward? I think we'll see um, some shifts in the marketplace. I mean, to, again, to use the Cisco example, um, you know, if these restaurants uh, manage to start selling some products to people in neighborhoods, especially in food deserts, for example. I mean, I think, you know, you might see a new type of business model emerge uh, with, where they obviously continue to do some of their restaurant business, but maybe keep selling some of these products as well. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. And I and, uh, have a restaurant by me that actually within the first week of, um, I think, right, it was the day before St. Patty's Day. So on the 16th, when they said everything was shutting down and there's an Italian restaurant around the corner that within a few days flipped into a marketplace. Mm -hmm. And instead of selling meals, they started selling their homemade spaghetti or pasta, mm -hmm. their homemade sauces batched up as a, uh, grocery items. And they changed their seamless account to reflect that. And mm -hmm. some, I know, uh, wine and liquor stores, um, or restaurants were doing that as well, essentially making themselves wine and liquor stores. Mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a restaurant. So mm -hmm. so all of this, um, I think one additional impact that this has had with, you know, some items going out of stock, I think emerging brands have kind of played a role of filling those gaps, uh, especially it's almost like a forced trial for consumers. It's like if they can't find their brand, you know, their normal brand, but you have this emerging brand here, they're going to try it anyway. So I think it's opened up opportunities for emerging brands. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a lot of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're seeing some of that uh, as well. Uh, and you've also seen products that were in the food service channel suddenly showing up on shelves of supermarkets. Um, so yeah, it is a, a definite opportunity. I think the small brands have the challenge, though, that if a major retailer calls up and says, we want this, can they produce it fast enough? So. I think that that's a little bit of a, a challenge for them. Yeah, that's that's definitely. Uh, um, it'll be hard for them to ramp up to do ten thousand uh, stores, mm -hmm. but maybe on a regional basis, it it uh, can yeah. help plug the holes. So, yeah, uh, yeah. and and I've seen and I heard stories of retailers just really searching for, you know, like uh, one retailer ran out of rice in the stores, mm -hmm. but they found this artisanal rice company. Mm -hmm. that had plenty of supply and actually was willing to work with them on a price mm -hmm. to just help them get the stuff on the shelves. And yeah. I've seen a lot of cases of that. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I, I have seen some of that uh, in more in the supermarket than the drugstore, but uh, absolutely. Yeah, and maybe so some of these maybe some of these guys will break through this way, as you say. Consumers will try the products and like them, and uh, opportunity for them. Yeah, that would be great. That would be nice to see if some of these guys get some play that way, even mm -hmm. though it's you know not for a great reason, you know, <laughs> this whole <laughs> pandemic, but. So, so uh, back to online, I think another thing that we've seen was, you know, a lot of retailers that weren't doing curbside pickup or e-commerce in a big way have had no choice to really, but to really focus on it. And I know when uh, Wayne did his interview with Derek Gaskins from Yesway, mm -hmm. uh, Derek had a great saying that I think it really captures what's going on where innovation becomes expectation mm -hmm. so now these retailers have been forced to really up their game on online and with curbside pickup and i think there's that's going to be an expectation down the road uh, uh would you agree with that or are you seeing that yeah i we're seeing that definitely i mean you, you think of uh, walmart who now you know you want it delivered they'll do that you want to pick it up at the store they'll do that uh, you know, obviously, you still can come in and shop if you choose. Uh, Walgreens is using its its drive through windows for pickup, and CVS is doing home delivery. And you know, I think all the retailers understand that um, the rules of the game are changing here, and that they're going to have to really live up to that omni-channel promise of giving consumers what they want, how they want it, when they want it. So, absolutely, it's going to change the equation uh, quite quite a bit. And mail order scripts are up. Uh, you know, people want to avoid going into public places, so if they can get stuff otherwise, definitely. And as you say, it will change expectations even when this crisis is over, although that, I think, will be when a vaccine is done, and that's probably at least a year away. Yeah, yeah. So because of all of this and the fact that I'm interviewing you via virtual uh, platform right now. I mean, mm. obviously, virtual is really becoming normal, mm. uh, part of the way they're doing business. It's actually getting in, you know, every aspect of the business. Uh, where, what areas are you seeing that uh, uh, retailers are adapting virtual to better serve their customers and to engage with each other as well? Well, you know, I think these trends were happening already, even prior to the COVID situation. But now you see great growth in, uh, you know, uh, uh, ordering online, of course, telemedicine, you know, where people will uh, consult with a pharmacist or a doctor, a nurse practitioner, as you and I are talking now. I think uh, the uh, value of cell phone communication, either text messages or emails or whatever, uh, is, uh, is uh, really important now. Uh, in light of the current conditions. And I think you'll see personalization efforts uh, directed via these digital channels uh, to a growing degree. And I will say this, I mean, I don't think stores are gonna go away. I think they're gonna remain important. I think uh, the value of stores has been demonstrated here in the city, I think you'd agree with me, uh, during this situation. But I think they're gonna have to change what they do. It's gonna have to become more experiential. They're gonna have to give you a reason to go to the store more than I need to pick up uh, you know, paper towels or whatever it may be. Um, they're gonna have to uh, make some service and expertise available to the consumer or make it sort of a theatrical experience, if you will. Um, so I think this will accelerate the process that was already underway there. and. Uh, uh, an experiential uh, focus will have to emerge uh, to a greater degree than it has in the past. Yeah, I mean, it certainly has with us. Uh, you know, w we, with all of our in-person sessions, now we've really flipped to a virtual model. And, you know, down the road, it's going to be a combination of both. Even when the pandemic is over, we've seen that just people are just so used to it now. And, they're kind of realizing some of the benefits uh, of it, uh, less travel, a little more convenience, you mm -hmm. know, uh, better use of their time. And I think everybody's just going to have to uh, find that sweet spot of virtual and, re and in-person, regardless of what it is, whether it's retail, whether it's communications with each other, all of that. 
Well, Joe, let me first say, you know, you were kind enough to give me a, a preview of what your new virtual tool looks like. It's quite impressive. I think it'll be very productive for the uh, retailers and suppliers that use it. And then I'll also say, though, that, I mean, there are some things that can't be done virtually, as I was alluding to before. I mean, I think the face-to-face -face interaction with a pharmacist, for example, you can do it virtually, but it's not quite the same, you know. Uh, and I think there will be some things, whether it's in trade shows or retail, that will still bring people together and need to bring people together. But you're, you're correct. A lot of things uh, people will get used to doing uh, uh, this way, and it will become a more digital uh, focus uh, in retail. I agree. I mean, as, as much as I'm excited about our launch next week, I still missed in person. I mean, I went to 48 of our sessions in person last year. Mm -hmm. And there is that, that in-person thing is always going to be my favorite. Uh, that being said, I have like switching over to the podcast and the video interview format just for me personally. I've actually loved it because I get to have these deeper conversations and I learn so much more. And then it gives me a lot more content assets to work with. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm interviewing someone for a half an hour, 20 minutes, not only do I have the long form, but I can segment that into different pieces for social media. So, you know, for me personally, too, this whole thing has really opened me up to other possibilities. And uh, it's, it's been a great experience. I think that uh, everyone is going to have to learn how to adapt and change their thinking and try new things. And the companies, the retailers, and the, and the suppliers as well who don't are the ones that are going to have problems. I mean, you know, it's, it's the old uh, uh, Darwinian survival of the fittest and, and, and adapting to changing conditions. And that's what the, the conditions have changed radically and suddenly, and now we'll see who has the wherewithal to uh, adapt. Yep. And, and speaking of digital, you know, everybody's spending so much more time on social media these days. Uh, are our retailers embracing social media a little more because of that or trying to get their messaging across through those channels? I think so. You know, I think they have to. They have to uh, try to seize all of the digital tools that are out there and uh, to, to make more of them. Uh, some companies are obviously uh, way ahead of others, but I think uh, if anybody wants to stay in the game, they need to uh, develop those capabilities at this point. Definitely. So, you know, I think one side effect of all of this happening is it's kind of brought the industry together in a very positive way and there's an overall kind of feel of you know everybody wants to pitch in and i've certainly seen that in in what you're reporting i think i think you're right and i, I think you know particularly in the healthcare and food sectors you see that a lot Unfortunately, because of the circumstances, some other categories suddenly are, you know, not doing well. You think of a lot of beauty products, for example. You think of different GM categories. You know, the climate uh, is very challenging for them at this point. So I think, uh, well, those companies certainly have the right attitude and certainly want to contribute. You know, we're so focused on the essentials of food and medicine at this point. That's where I really see a lot of activity. It's going to give consumers, it's going to change the way they think about what is essential. I think me personally, I know I've learned from this experience that there are a lot of things that I can live without and do differently. And that's definitely going to impact the way I shop. I've also been shopping a lot healthier, almost kind of. It, you know, this whole thing makes you think more about wellness and health. And in fact, I was just talking to um, uh, Elizabeth from uh, WSL Strategic about that, that, you know, that whole uh, well uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how this is really, really bringing that to the forefront. Yeah, I think uh, people's priorities have changed. They, they see what's, uh, as you say, essential to them, to their, to their well-being and what maybe is a uh, a nice thing to have, but not necessarily uh, essential. And, it, you know, there probably will be some reshuffling of um, priorities in consumers' minds. 
you know, in light of this experience, but also just the economic difficulties that so many people have. I mean, you know, you have more than 30 million people out of work, and I think that's going to have a profound effect on retailing for several years to come. Uh, it's going to be probably a fairly slow uh, climb back to pre-COVID levels. And uh, as you were saying, I think it'll maybe change people's priorities as they go into the store. Yeah, definitely. It definitely has mine. You know, it's, uh, I shop completely differently now. I still go to, in, to stores. Most mm -hmm. of my shopping is in the store because I have so many stores, little markets all around uh, my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I will go online for some things, usually the things I can't find in the stores. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then, you know, for things I would typically get online beforehand, books and, mm -hmm. and you know. But uh, I still, whenever possible, go to the markets in my neighborhood. One, I want to support them. Mm -hmm. And uh, two, the speed. I mean, I could go to the organic marketplace across the street and get what I need relatively quickly during the day and it's not too crowded. So uh, it's definitely, I think this is, and, and I think uh, um, this is going to last for a while. This is, the ramifications of this is going to go on for a bit. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, uh, as I say, until the vaccine is developed, we're going we're gonna to just be in this situation for a while. Maybe we won't be locked down at home, but uh, we're going to be taking all sorts of precautions and not moving around uh, like normal until there's a vaccine. Uh, and then even after there's a vaccine, it, it's going to be a little climb back economically and getting these 30 million people back to work. You know, and I, I will say in terms of personnel, you know, uh, which sometimes we take for granted, the people who are in the stores and operate the stores and stockers and cashiers and, you know, uh, the supply chain people uh, deserve a lot of credit uh, for what they've done during the situation. They go to work every day. They're putting themselves in harm's way. And uh, I think everyone, uh, the retail community, but everyone owes them some thanks. And one more thing I'd just like to add. I think that uh, the major retailers who've been asked by the federal government and state governments to uh, lend a helping hand have been exemplary. And uh, those, you know, uh, would be Walmart, Kroger, Walgreens, CVS, uh, Rite Aid, uh, Target. You know, uh, they've answered the call and uh, I think uh, also deserve some credit for stepping up and trying to do whatever they can. Yeah, but I think that that whole goodwill is and efforts, I, you know, is part of that whole coming together thing. And I think mm -hmm. if anything continues ongoing after this whole thing, I hope it's that spirit of mm -hmm. we're all in this together and let's just help everybody out. That is one thing that I hope stays forever after mm -hmm. this whole pandemic is done. Yeah, well said. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, I really you know, enjoyed this, but I will enjoy more when we can get together again in person. And, uh, you know, we're long overdue for a dinner. Uh, we so, so we have to do that. So thanks again and uh, stay safe. You too. My pleasure. Thank you. I All right. enjoyed it.